Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Collective Clicks podcast. Today, I'm interviewing Tommy Anderson, who's a member of my team. Uh, we talk all about um, digital marketing and how you can choose an agency. So if you're kind of at that point where you're thinking, maybe I should choose this company, or I should choose a different company, and you're not sure, Tommy has a pretty unique perspective that I think you'll enjoy. Thank you, guys. I'll see you there. Tommy, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Hey, Brandon, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. It's uh, I've been looking forward to this day. It's a big day for me. Yeah, it's, it's the day where you make your public debut, right? This is the this is where your fame begins. And not only is this my debut for Bateman Collective, but this is my podcast debut. I've, I've never actually been on a podcast. I listen to them all the time, and uh, and now dreams do come true. Yeah, well, I'm uh, yeah, I'm super excited to have you here. For for anybody who's wondering who this Tommy guy is, um, tell me. Uh, well, well, first, let's talk about like how we know each other. Like, like in what capacity do we work together? And then I'd love to dive deeper into like who you are as a person and, and how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. So I am an account executive for Bateman Collective. I have uh, I've been here since the end of September last year, 2023. Uh, my job here is to meet with with new potential clients let them know what our services, who Bateman Collective is, what it's going to be like working for us. And uh, really, honestly, I've always felt, and we'll dive deeper into this, I'm sure, Brandon, but uh, not to get too deep, but I, I've always just felt like, you know, I want to get to know somebody. You know, we're, we're a really tight-knit group here at Bateman, uh, and we're not just trying to bring on anybody and everybody that says they're a real estate investor. So I, I feel like a big part of my job is to meet people and see if they're going to be a good fit uh, for, for Bateman collective. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And, uh, and you're a dang good at it. Oh, <laughs> <Very, very laughs> thanks nice. man. Um, unless you're a competitor of ours, in which case, um, stay away from Tom. And he's <laughs> probably gonna get fired tomorrow. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, 10, four. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about your journey. Like, like how you got here. Um, what, one, before, before we get too deep into that, like one thing that's like, let's just talk about how hard it is what you do. And, and a lot of people don't realize like how, how, um, you know, how much of an impact it makes. Um, like you're a part of people's initial decision to choose to work with this company or not, which is, which is a huge thing. Um, but in addition to that, like, if you picture like how sales works in most companies, sales is like, Hey, you want to work with us yet? Hey, do you want to work with, with us yet? Hey, I could discount you this much, whatever. It's basically just like. Like I'm, I'm, I'm hunting for deals. Whereas we take like more of a consultative approach, which means that all of our sales people are, are experts in this marketing and in this industry, um, which makes it really, really hard to train people. Um, but, and it makes your job super hard, right? So you're like, yes, you want people to work with us, but also you're held to a pretty high standard of getting the right people on, um, not to share too much, but like in general, our sales team actually makes more commission from our retention of clients than they do from selling new clients and bringing in one bad apple hurts their entire, um, their entire game. Right. So you're kind of looking at it from the standpoint of, I got to get the right people in and you're actually building digital marketing strategies with those people. Cause that's kind of always been my belief is like, that's, that's how we, um, you know, that's how we add value straight from the beginning. We don't want it to feel like, uh, you know, you have to, yeah, you have to kind of get that to get to the value. No question. And I, I feel like that's always a message I want to send to our clients. And, you know, I, I know there's a lot of options out there, right? There's a lot of agencies out there that, that offer inbound leads that, that run, run ads through Google and Facebook and Microsoft and some SEO and website builds. I understand that, that everybody has options out there. Um, to speak on the retention part, you know, we, I do mean that for anybody listening out there, if you hear it in one of my calls, when I say I'm, that a lot of our team is incentivized on retention, that's 100% true. But really, the message there is, is if you look at it in a roundabout way, really, we start getting paid when you guys are doing well, right? When you start seeing success. So if you're retaining with us and staying for a long time, everybody's winning, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think when I say, hey, we're incentivized on retention, it's like, oh, great, what does that mean? But when you look at it, it's like, hey, once you guys are really killing it and doing well, that's, that's when everybody's bonusing. And, it, and it's a great feeling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, retention is like the number that shows how well your clients are doing. If your clients are doing well, and they tend to stay with you longer. If they're doing poorly, they tend not to, right? And, and you know, how we set expectations is a huge part of that. 
Um, I know like that's, that's a big part of what you do is like making sure that you're setting fair expectations with people in the beginning. Um, cause we never want to feel like that company where like you, you talk to Tommy, you feel like he, he sold you the world and then you, you see what's behind the curtain and, and you wish you never talked to Tommy in the first place. Like that's, that's never been, uh, that's never been the goal, but that probably going a little bit too far that direction. I, I want to talk more about like you, what's, what's we'll your get back- there. Yeah. Tell me like what, what drives you? What's your background? Um, you know, how'd you, how'd you end up here? Let's start from the beginning, Brandon. So okay. I, uh, I grew I grew up in, in Michigan, um, a little town right outside of Ann Arbor. I went to, uh, I was a hockey guy. I played hockey my whole entire life. I still coach and I still play obsessively to this day. It feeds my competitive, uh, need if you will. Uh, so I love the game, but so I played all the way through through youth, uh, juniors into college as well. Went to school at Central Michigan University. I graduated in 2012. Funny story, it was it was in an entrepreneurship degree that that I got from from college, uh, and um, cool. so I really didn't know what I wanted to do as a professional sales and entrepreneurship degree. There was all these different ways I could go through college, and and I was working full time delivering pizzas so I could pay for college. And I was also, you know, I worked shifts from like, I worked five shifts from 4 a.m. To, or 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. And then I'd be at class at 9 a.m. I'm going too deep into that. But um, from that, I, I really loved working there and the entrepreneurial spirit of being on my own and working my routes, et cetera. And they offered this entrepreneurial degree. It was brand new at, at Central Michigan. So I pursued that and I was one of the first uh, classes to, to graduate from that particular degree that they offered there um i don't did i ever tell you about my my laundry career no i have i've never heard such a thing yeah so so in that you had to do an internship you had to do a a full summer internship in order to graduate from that program that central michigan was offering so everybody went off and they're working at all these firms and you know they're pushing paper and doing all these boring like intern jobs uh, for all these companies all over michigan I didn't have time. I was paying for college, was delivering pizzas. So I, there was a laundromat right next to our pizza shop and it's called Mountain Tin and Laundry. And I came up with this, like this model, there was 20,000 kids in our school and about 15,000 of those kids had to pay to do their own laundry. Right? So not only did they have to do their own laundry, they had to pay to do it. So I, long story short, I started what's called, what was called Laundry Boys. And we would do uh, paper wash. They could fill up a 25 pound bag full of that, or they could do a semester plan or a full year plan. Anyway, I grew that to about 35 clients and I sold that back to the laundromat where I was getting discount laundry back. And I also got that approved to be my, uh, my internship for entrepreneurship. And that's kind of where my, my, my whole business career started. Graduated college, moved out to Utah, Park City to be a ski bum. And then, um, I stayed for a winter and then stayed for a summer and fast forward. I now live in Utah. I work for a great company, Bateman Collective. My wife's seven months pregnant. I own a house and I am a Utah. I am here. Yeah. Cool. Good, good for you. Um, and, and I think you, you skipped a part there. What were you doing right before you started working with, uh, with Bateman Collective? Um, right. In the real estate space, right? That's right. Yeah. So, um, I got hooked on with a small company. It was called Park City Rental Properties at the time. They managed about, uh, 75 short-term rentals just in Park City, everywhere from a one bedroom condo to a 20,000 square foot, like ski mansion. Right. Uh, I worked there for about seven years and grew that company to 720 properties total in Park City. We also expanded to Sedona, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, Whitefish, Texas, I'm sorry, Whitefish, Montana, Austin, Texas, Cabo uh, in Mexico, and Hawaii, Oahu and Hawaii. And um, so I, I did a lot for that company. I built a lot of systems and processes for them uh, for both the sales side as well as acquiring uh, owners. So I was on owner acquisition side as well as uh, sales for, for reservations for, for short-term rentals, which is a very, very interesting market, especially going through through COVID. COVID was, as a lot of the investors know here, I speak with investors all the time. They're like, man, COVID was the best. I had like five short-term rentals and I was making so much money on them and I wanted to get a bunch of them. And, 
And um, everybody listening know that that's, that market's become a lot more competitive and, and a little bit more saturated because I think everybody, um, everybody saw that, hey, I could pick up 10 vacation rentals and they're just going to, I'm going to have positive cash flow from those. Um, and that's become a little more saturated. So anyway, yeah, I worked for that. And then, uh, and then I learned about Bateman Collective, long story short. Uh, and I wanted to get a part of the Bateman Collective train, if you will. I, I saw what you guys were doing um, and totally believe in that nobody really does what Brandon has created uh, in the collective strategy and, and aggregating data and using everybody's enhanced learnings. And uh, I decided to, to come on board. Yeah, well, I'm, and I'm super, super grateful that you did. You know, this is kind of a, a side note. Let's talk about the self-esteem that you give me. Um, so the, like, there's no way to know if you're a good leader, really. Like, no, no, like, objective way, um, except one. Like, who are your followers? That's mm-hmm. one of the, one of the biggest, one of the biggest things, right? So, like, like, generally, if, like, all the people in your company suck, it's because you suck. And if the people in your company are great, then it's because, it's because you're more likely to be great in that circumstance, at least at like attracting and, and leading those people. You want to used to always say the fish, the fish rots from the head down. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I never heard yeah. it said like, yeah. So, so anyways, when I, yeah, when I just realized that, that you work here and, and if anybody's like listening to this, um, you don't know Tommy like I do. <laughs> so like there's a, <laughs> there's, it's, it's hard to find somebody like, so, so driven, but also so humble. Um, and and like coachable and eager to learn right like somebody who like is the top of their game but at the same time like acts on a day-to-day basis like they're at the bottom of the game and they have to get better right with that like hunger to learn um it's hard to find somebody more like that than than you tommy um so when i think about uh, that thanks, like, you know, maybe i don't suck so much tommy wouldn't be here if i sucked <laughs> that much right um, and, uh, yeah. So I, I, and I think Brandon to speak on that too, I think, you know, obviously I took a big gamble on, on coming to Bateman Collective. I absolutely did. I was very comfortable. My last job, we were growing like crazy. I think I'm a horizon. It was going to sell. And, uh, I think the most, the, the more comforting moment was my first couple of weeks here when I, when I started meeting everybody that runs the systems, that runs the platforms, the ads campaigns, who does the support, who does sales, the leaders of our company, when I realized how, A, cool they were, right? Anybody who's ever got a new job, you want to be like, look, I, I, I definitely want to make money. I definitely want to be with the right company, but I want to work with cool people. A, they're super cool people. I mean, we're a young group, Brandon, right? It's crazy because I'm 36 years old and I'm one of the older people in the, in the company, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which, which is funny, but number one, everybody's super cool and and b is is everybody is is truly truly brilliant right i say it on our calls all the time that i work with some of the smartest people brandon i don't know if you've listened to our calls but obviously your name's on the door it's bateman collective so people obviously want to know about brandon bateman right because you're kind of the founder and and the designer of this whole strategy and i always say look brandon's one of the smartest people i've ever met i always compare it to the matrix sometimes we get talking and, you know, we're talking about filtered water at, at, the, at, the, uh, at the kiln office. Next thing you know, we're talking about, you know, a deep dive into Google Ads. I feel like I'm talking to somebody in the matrix where there's like numbers coming down. I'm like, what is this guy talking about? But um, it's, it's how everybody is. Everybody's very smart and driven and, um, and curious. Yeah. Yeah. Curious is a you know, great, great word to, to describe it. Um, that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of the culture that we've, uh, that we built in the company. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, I'm grateful. I'm grateful you took that, that chance on us and, and you're, um, you know, you're doing what you're doing, um, now, I think one of the things that you, you get to benefit from that not all of us get to, to benefit from is you have an ear to the ground on the, in the industry. Like you're talking, you, you spend, like, I don't care who you are. You probably don't talk to as much real, as many real estate investors as Tommy Anderson does <laughs> because <laughs> you're any market, any investor, generally more savvy investors are the ones that are reaching out to us. Although you get someone, um, you know, newer to the game, um, for here and there. Um, but I'm curious to, to hear from, from your standpoint, like, like what's, what, where are we at? Like what's going on in the industry and, and, um, you know, how does, uh, what we do fit into that right now? 
Yeah. So, um, and I, and just to speak on, on what you said, yes, real estate investors are absolutely the salt of the earth people. Um, I, I have a, a great pleasure in getting to know everybody. Everybody has an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, they're very, very driven. Most of them, most of the people I talk to are, are hilarious too, right? There's no filter on them, right? And, and it also speaks to who they are. And a big part of my job, I mean, listen, real estate investors, you guys are type A. You guys want results now, right? <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you uh, you see it in front of you and you want to get it. And you want to get there as fast as you can. And that's a big reason why you're talking to us. Um, so I have to always kind of have that discussion of what patience looks like uh, on the digital marketing side and, and really coach them on that. And I can kind of see when I talk about, you know, there's a patient side here. Uh, I can start seeing the, the smile sort of like, wait, what, what do you mean patience? And a line I always use is say, look, man, if, if this was an exact science, we would close our doors and we'd just be real estate investors right now. <laughs> right? Like hey, if, if, I, if I told you, hey, you're going to sign up and, and it's just going to be millions coming through the door. It's unbelievable. I can't believe you guys found us. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's not the case. There's always a, a patience process in that and, and being type A personality is very result driven. That's, that's a big challenge uh, in my job is, is to sort of explain. But once... Once we get through that phase, typically it's, it's a great ride, right? And it, and it gets better as, as we go through that. But, you know, what's happening in the space? Um, God, Brandon, I, I, could go, I could go on and on about everybody's exit strategy. You know, I mean, everybody, everybody it seems like are doing the same thing, but everybody has a different niche, right? I mean, everybody, there's all these exit strategies out there, wholesaling, fix and flipping, um, you know, creative financing, buy and holds, novations, and everybody has a great mix in that. And it really depends on which markets they're in, right? And, and it's great because so many people have so much experience where they've done one thing, they've tried another, now it's not working, now they're reaching out into a community. Uh, what's really cool is that, you've said this before, competition with real estate investors, they look at other competitions like like the boogeyman, right? And that's how it's been for, for so long. But now I, I feel like so many more people are joining together and connecting, um, you know, referring even the same agency that they might use the same exit strategy, even in the same markets, right? Mm. It's an ever evolving yeah. group of people and they're always kind of rolling with the tide of real estate market, digital marketing, um, outbound marketing, all these sort of things. Everybody's always looking for the next best thing. Yep. I'm curious to hear from, from your perspective. Let me preface this first. Like we can learn, we can learn skills somewhat easily as people, right? It's easy to say, I don't know how to do X, Y, Z. I learned how to do X, Y, Z. Some of the biggest changes that have come into the results that I'm able to generate, generate as a person have come not from changing skills, but changing beliefs. You know, there's things that we just believe inherently that, that don't serve us they don't help us get from where we are to where we're trying to go and 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 sometimes it's it's kind of hard to to question those those things um that said you you talk to a lot of investors and you hear what they believe about this marketing in your opinion is there anything that investors in general believe about this digital marketing that you feel that that belief wouldn't serve them and what, what would you, uh, yeah, what would you say to correct that? I think that what happens, and I talk about this on our calls all the time, is that influencers have a, uh, a big influence, right? I mean, in this space, and there's a lot at their fingertips with YouTube and reels and shorts and, and, and all these influencers that get on there and, and they start pumping saying PPC leads. PPC leads are where it's at. The leads are so hot, right? And, and you're going to get on the phone and these people are ready to go. They're ready to just give you their house, right? Their keys are dangling right there. Um, and, and then they go, okay, I got to get on PPC leads. Who does PPC leads, right? And then they start Googling different agencies and this guy does PPC and this guy does PPC and that person does PPC, right? And really there's so much more than just finding an agency that delivers PPC leads, right? Because Anybody with a budget and a laptop with Wi-Fi on it can start a Google Ads campaign and start going after inbound leads from PPC. Um, so I think that just because somebody does PPC leads in this space doesn't mean it's done the right way. It is such a niche market, and really you have to have a lot of data behind that to 
target an exact search, an exact user online that we know historically is going to has made a deal so we can find that user when it comes up at the right time. Right. And I think that there's a lot of agencies popping up out there now that are very capable of running um, a PPC campaign, a Google ads campaign, but do they have enough historical data to get really, really targeted? The, the line I always use is that I think there's so many agencies out there that take your budget and they swing at every single pitch, right? They always are just swinging at every single pitch. Anything real estate that comes through on a search term on Google, they want to show up for. So what they do is they're, they're just going to push for budget, push for budget, push for budget. Give me your budget so I can get in front of everything and you're going to get a bunch of clicks and a bunch of leads and we'll figure it out from there. Uh, I think where Bateman Collective is, is that we have the ability and the data and the historical data to, to be able to swing at the right pitches, not just every single pitch. We want to show up when, that you, when we know who that user is that creates deals for you guys. We want to show up for that user. We want to be there waiting for them with a nice ad and a nice landing page. So they click on it. We can get, we, we can get you in front of them. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a really interesting way of describing it. I haven't heard it that way before. Um, yeah, I think kind of what I hear you saying is it's hard to, um, it's hard to know one company from another. Cause like, th this is something we've been talking about a little bit internally recently is like, we have a lot of competition out there that basically talks about how they're like super data driven mm -hmm. and we can't necessarily prove that wrong. There's different levels yeah. to that game, but like, you know, maybe, maybe to somebody listening to it, it's like you hear from one company, we're super data driven. And then you hear from us, we're data driven and you're like, okay, they're all the same. And there's, there's like different levels to the game, but you don't know, like, you're not able to really understand that and, and see those different levels until unless you understand the game on the same level as the people who are talking to you, in which case you've invested a lot of time and energy into understanding that game. And it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's almost like it's hard. People ask me sometimes how to choose the right agency in the space. Like, how do you know? Um, and I honestly put myself in their shoes and I'm like, I have absolutely no idea. Like at, at the end of the day, like the only thing I can think is so trust. It's like, it's like me, the, the, the level that I invest in real estate is passive. I invest in syndications because I stay in my lane, right? Like people say, why don't you start a real estate, real estate investing business? Well, because I'm good at marketing, not at real estate investment. And I don't want to be bad at both. Right. So what I, what I choose to do is I, is I focus on this company and then I find other people. I, same thing we ask our clients to do with us. You find somebody that you trust and then you give them a budget. Um, I find people that are doing real estate deals through syndications and then I invest as a limited partner investor passively into those deals. Um, when these people send me the deals, they always want to send this pitch deck and they say like, this is the property and this is where it is and blah, blah, blah. And I don't even care. Honestly, I hardly look at it. I look at who's the operator and do I trust this person? Because I know, I know, I know a small enough amount of information about this deal that they could probably convince me that it's a good deal, even if it's not a good deal. So that's, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for like, you know, their, what kind of target returns they're saying, or the fact that it's in a good area and all their statistics that back that and stuff. And it's nice to know that they've looked into all that. Right. What I end up looking at is like, do I trust this person? And, and there's a few things that I look for in somebody that I trust. I look for somebody that's really ambitious. I look for somebody that's very humble and somebody that's very curious. Right. They're not like saying this is for sure the best deal. They're more like, well, I don't know. It could be a better deal if it was like that or, or like this. And they're willing to take like different information in and adapt their, their mindset based on that. Um, that that's super, super important. So that, that's all the advice I have is like, you just have to work with people that you trust and you measure, you know, do you trust them based on the culture of their company and the, and the, you know, the, the fruits of that, that, that are generated. So let me, let me turn the table then. We obviously know what the quote unquote problem is, right? There's a lot of companies out there that claim they're data driven and it's true. They are data driven, right? They absolutely are. Obviously mm -hmm. internally, Brandon, we know just how much data we have and, and how we aggregate that across all of our accounts and how we do the deep dive control funnel analysis of everybody's account. We know all that stuff, right? But talking to somebody who I have to show, Hey, here's what a sponsored ad looks like. I'm Google. How do you explain that? Because they say like, well, Hey, everybody's kind of data driven and what makes you guys different? So from a term from like 
if I'm somebody who doesn't, I need to be sure what a PPC ad is, putting you on the hotspot, Brandon, put you in my seat here real quick. Uh, what would you say to that person? Honestly, I think it's just the same as the real estate deals, right? You, you could always say like, oh, here's the, here's the deal. Here's the target IRR. Um, here's all the experience I have in the same zip code where I'm buying this property and stuff like that. And like, that's, that's good. But at the end of the day, like, if, if, if that's you, you're in a position where anybody could mislead you if they want to. And we have to recognize that like, you just, you just look for people that you believe to be good operators of the business and that you can trust. Um, and at the same time, educate yourself to the extent that you can, um, this I podcast, like the fact that someone's already listening to this, like the fact that you're hearing the words I'm speaking right now means you're already on the path to educating yourself, um, about this. Because I mean, should, ev but should everybody have to know everything about this? No, like you just have to, you just have to know, you just have to trust, um, somebody there's even the level of, I can tell you what, like most of our clients would say for why they chose us and why I think it's BS. The, what they would generally say is like, well, you don't really know. So you just talk to other people who are using that company and see what they think, but that actually assumes that the perspective of a current client has anything to do with your potential success with the company, which isn't true. Um, like for example, let's just say we're doing SEO and you're a client of mine on SEO and I do a bunch of black hat stuff. that's going to screw you over in the long term, but pumps up your rankings right now for the next three months. Do you think you're a happy client of mine? And you're probably going to tell other people that you got great rankings and really fast. Yeah, probably. Right. Yeah. Does that mean that I'm good and I'm actually the best place for you to be putting your money or for anybody else to be putting their money? No, it doesn't. Right. It turns out the companies like on an SEO side that invest in the most long-term strategies, which tend to be the best for their clients are the ones that have the least advantage when it comes to getting immediate referrals because doing it right takes time and some black hat agency will just, you know, get results super fast that don't sustain and, and get a lot of referrals. Um, or when it comes to the, the marketing, like some of the, some of the, some really successful companies that I've seen on PPC, it's just cause they have a killer sales process. And then I look at their ads and I'm like, I cannot believe you're accomplishing this with the level of which this campaign is run. Um, that happens True. sometimes, right? Um, there's, and the, yeah, there's just so much, um, so much information going around. We even have clients that like, don't even know what they're getting. They don't know their metrics, right? They're telling people out there that they have a 10 X return. Meanwhile, they have a five X return. <laughs> And it's, so basically what I'm saying is like, I just, uh, like, like referrals are nice. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's the validity of the, of what you're buying that matters. And it's the fact that it's a good operator. Cause that's, what's going to make it like, like, what well, here's another example. Um, so let's just say someone's getting good results right now. That's probably based on us having a focus on testing and product mm -hmm. development fast. So then people can get results right now. But let's just say I'm a normal agency. I'm not actually continually investing into my product to make it better. How most agencies work is like, I figured out how to make ads work once. And now I'm just going to copy and paste that until my business burns to the ground one day. That's, that's how like most agencies are operating right now. Cause it's a thin margin business and you don't really have ability to continually invest in, in, uh, in, in product. We do carve out that budget to continually invest in, in product to continually test and continually make things better. Um, there's, there's no like we figured out this is what works and we just copy and paste that across everybody. Like we are doing that, but at the same time, we're constantly challenging what works to make it better. So if you look like this, just say you were to work with right now, a company that's focusing on like a long-term strategy, that's going to get you the best results. They're going to be investing a lot into split testing right now. Um, and that's not necessarily going to make a difference to you right now, but that's going to make it so that this company is at the top of their game in three years in five years, you don't want like, it, it's like, let's just say you're investing in an athlete that you think is going to, for example, for, for the sake of example that, that you might resonate with, um, going to be the best hockey player in the world. Right. Do you want to go with the person who has a lot of skill and then they just decided they're not going to practice anymore and they're just going to perform like when they need to perform, but they're just perfect they're just, analogy. They're just not going to, yeah. yeah. So, so who would you put your money behind? I want to put my money behind the guy who's grinding every day taking mm -hmm. every single opportunity that you can pass to absolute because I'm focused not just on this partnership being something that works like right now, but I want something that's going to work for years to come. 
And I want mm -hmm. confidence that he's always going to be the top of this game. Referrals don't tell you that about an agency. You have to look at their structure. How are they built? What do they prioritize? Um, so anyway, sorry, that was like, that was like a, a ramp. I think like even the ways that people, other people. Uh, like my wheels are turning so fast on this whole thing too now, Brandon, too, because obviously I, I can only dive so deep into conversion tracking and the amount of data that we have and the pixel and how much spend is in that and how much data is in that. But it's not going to resonate for somebody that has a very, very basic understanding where PPC is, right? It's all going to come down to, what do you think? It's going to come down to price, right? And I get the objection yeah. all the time. In my you know the difference. Is, you just, yeah. It's like the equivalent of me like looking for big deals based on like who has the highest target IRR. Well, this guy says he'll right. give me 30%. This guy says he'll only give me 12. Do you think the guy who says 30 is better than the guy who says 12? Not necessarily. There's a lot of factors there that you just don't understand about those deals. Dude, it's the same thing I dealt with in the short-term rental property industry when I was working with acquisitions in getting owners to, to sign on with us, right? Park City yeah. Rental Properties was the most expensive firm. I mean, we were. We were at a 35 split, 65-35 split. There was 20 other companies in town that were doing 10, 15, 20, 25%. When you look at them on paper, it's like, okay, yes, they do the cleanings. They do the maintenance. They do weekly inspections. They also have a, a marketing agency that markets their properties. They have a sales team. I, I don't see the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with the 10 or 15 or 20%. But meanwhile, I understood what the other agent, what the other places were doing. I'm not going to bad melt them or, or say, but I had a good understanding of what the cheaper spots were doing. I knew how they were getting, offering 10 to 15% to make margins, whereas we were at 35% because our quality of service was that much better. Our team was that much better. And so eventually I said, look, what's, what's, I know you guys are looking at your bottom line. And I've been in this space long enough, we've been talking about short-term vacation rentals, to understand that your bottom line is not affected by a cheaper management cost. Your bottom line is going to be affected by poorly marketed, nobody following up with any leads, uh, poor sales process, poor property maintenance, lack of weekly inspections, that sort of thing. That's what's really going to affect your bottom line, right? Yeah, 100. Not, not, a, not a cheaper management cost. Yeah, you and I were just talking to... Uh... To a, a larger investor in the space uh, about a week ago, who absolutely agreed, he's like, "I'll pay you guys a hundred thousand dollars a month management fee if you want it." <laughs> um, I loved hearing that. Yeah, because you don't go broke paying a management fee; you go broke with an underperforming marketing campaign. A no, high performing marketing campaign pays a management fee. If you look at like how are we as a company able to have that continual investment into our product, into innovating, into being the best, it's because we charge more than other companies. Like, it's not like people can just make like money appear out of thin air. It's not like I can have the same price as everybody else, but also invest way more into the product. That's why people with cheaper prices have worse products. There's a virtuous cycle. If you have a higher price, you then have more money to invest into getting the best talent, into getting more of those people to build the right processes, to innovate your product, which then makes it so that your clients are getting more value, which means that you can raise your prices, which means then that you have the right money to invest into more of those things. And it's just this, this virtuous cycle where a lot of people just get stuck. Like, like I just, mm -hmm. I can't, we don't have the budget as a company to become what we need to be, to do a better job for our clients. The wild thing, like you and I did this analysis with this company. And do you remember the number? Like we, we like mathematically calculated it. Like how much better do your results need to be in order to justify us charging? In this case, we were going to build this company $14,000 a month for management compared to 5,000. That's what we were fighting with. Um, and thankfully they got it. Like we won the bid. We, like they're going to work with us, even though we're $14,000 a month compared to the five. But because like we can show 14,000 a month compared to five, if we can get you 1.85% better results. It wasn't much. It pays for that. So then you have to think like in theory, could a company with triple the resources to put towards my account, could they find a way to get me 1.85% better results? And the answer is a resounding no brainer. Yes. Yeah. Like what if, what if they could pay their people more? What if they could recruit higher level people than that other company? What if they could have more people? Um, what if they could have an extra department just focus on how do we get like way better at, at doing what we do? Like all those things, like, do they add up? They absolutely do. So that's like, so I am so focused on efficiency. Like I'm an efficiency person, which you would think makes me like low price, but I look at the efficiency of the whole relationship. Like, I think it's inefficient if you're paying a company less money to do less, resulting in less revenue. 
Right. And I think you have to, the way I always look at it too, and again, for anybody listening, like and anybody who's ever talked to me, I am not a, I don't like to bad mouth or poke holes in anybody's strategy or there's a lot of great companies out there. There's a lot of great people out there, right? That's, yep. that, that's not the goal. But the, the question is, you know, I always want to say is like, how, right? If they're offering the same thing we are, you guys know that we work with some great people that have driven results and we have a great retention rate, this sort of thing. So how is somebody doing the same thing that we are at the top of the game and charging half? Right? Yeah. It, it, you just have to ask yourself how. Oh, there has to be a way, right? I dealt with it in the short-term vacation room. I'm sure there's a million different industries of the same way. If, if it's a less monthly fee or management cost or percentage or cut, there has to be a way. There are corners being cut somewhere, right? It's, it's their way of being able to compete with some real players out there that have great strategies, great data, a lot of earned data over the years, right? There has to be a way that they can compete. And there has to yep. be a reason that it's going to be half the cost. Yeah, you, the, 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 the very top of the, uh, the very best company is never the cheapest. It just, it just doesn't make no, sense. It's... Like, there'd be no reason to. Like, if, if you're really no, good, you don't not. have to be cheap. And, and if you're cheap, it's like, it, it's a virtuous cycle. Like, it's, when you're cheap, it's hard to be good. So I'm not saying, like, like, I think the problem, like, if we're saying a company has a problem, I think their problem is that they charge too little so they can't afford to give people what they actually want. Um, so, or what they actually need. So anyways, putting, putting that all to, to the side, yeah. I, I appreciate and, your time that you, we spent together, Tommy. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I was just going to say, there's a common theme in my life or who I am too. I, with, 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 when I worked for that short-term vacation, well, they were the best in class, right? They, you know, what also came with it, they were the most expensive. So when I was working with my business coach and sort of taking a new path in life or a new challenge for myself, it was the number one criteria when she asked me that. She said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I really don't care. I just want to work with the best people and the best in class, right? And I think I got an understanding of diving deeper into who we are and the strategy that we that we have and the data that we use and just how much, like all that sounds great. Like the data is great, spend's great, the R&D is great, but just how much everybody cares here, th there's no question that this group that I work with is, is the best in class, no question. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate it, Tommy. I, I'm going to agree with you. Um, but we're biased. So, so for anybody listening, you figure it out for yourself. <laughs> um, get to a call, talk to Tommy, um, see if he can convince you. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, please do. Uh, but please I can tell do. you, like, he's he's speaking from his heart here, like uh, because I because I know Tommy to be that guy. Um, so, like, if 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 like we're wrong about this, like, it's not because we're lying. It's because we just are truly like fooled. Yeah, it's yeah, worse. and yeah. and that's what I'm telling you. And you can jump on that call and you can tell me that I'm that I'm full of it in the first few minutes, and we could spend the rest of the time talking about baseball, and then you can write that off as it's a, a work call. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, thank thank you, Tommy, for uh, for taking the time today. For anybody else listening, um, I will see you next week. Thanks, Brandon.